All right, everybody. Hey, my name is Aaron. I am from Aaron's Audio Corner, and I'm doing a review on the Eclipse Heresy 4. Uh, I am doing this live for a number of reasons, but one is really because I wanted to kind of get some feedback in real time uh, about questions you may have about the speaker rather than trying to come back to the comments section later and answer them. Sometimes I just don't have the time to do that, and I see questions that maybe go unanswered by myself or every once in a while maybe answered incorrectly by somebody else who doesn't really have maybe the experience or the same opinion that I carry. Uh, just, you know, I'm busy. We all are. So I thought I would try to knock this one out live and uh, we'll give it a go. So, um, yeah, the Clips Heresy 4. I reviewed this last November. You're probably wondering why am I reviewing this again? And there's there's two reasons why. The first one is really quite simple. I have recently gotten in the Clips Heresy 4 speaker for review. And I wanted to be able to do kind of a comparison between the Heresy, not the Heresy, I'm sorry, the Forte 4. So the Forte 4 versus the Heresy 4. But in order to do that comparison, I needed to do some testing with the Heresy 4 in the same manner that I have done it with the Forte 4, which means that last year I didn't use the Clipple Near Field Scanner because I did not have it. And now I do. So I have retested the Heresy 4 using the Clipple Near Field Scanner. And at some point, I will do a review on the Forte 4, and then following that, I will do a comparison between the two different speakers and talk about that. Now, the second reason I'm doing this review uh, is more personal. It is because last year when I did the Heresy 4 review, I kind of went into it with uh, maybe a chip on my shoulder. Uh, I know why. I won't get into that. But um, suffice it to say that, you know, it's kind of cringeworthy. I watched it back and... I don't know. I wasn't proud of it, but it was a good set of data that I was proud of. It was just my attitude going into it. You know, uh, it was unnecessary. So with that said, I'm going to kind of go about this in a different manner. And maybe instead of trying to preach to everybody about this is why this speaker sucks and why you shouldn't buy it and all that. I, mean, I know people like what they like. I'm going to go at it with a different tact and I'm going to talk to you about why I don't like it. Cause yeah, I still don't like the speaker. Um, I, I honestly think it's, it's, I mean, people talk about value. It's not a speaker that I would recommend. Um, I would just frankly would not run it, period. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. So let's see here. Um, looks like the chat's going. I've got some good feedback from you guys. So yes, good stuff here. And um, is there anything else I needed to say about the Heresy 4? Oh, it came to me from a friend out of Atlanta, Georgia, who brought it over last summer. So that's where it came from. Uh, everything is good. Powered it with a Parasound Hint 6, uh, like a pre-pro kind of deal uh, built into it. What's the word I'm looking for? Like Not like an AVR, but the whole thing uh, built in. So plenty of power. I know that people are going to talk about, well, you should have used tube amps because that makes the speaker sound, et cetera. And that's just not the case. Um, I know people had that opinion, but the funny thing is I actually reached out to Klipsch and asked them, Hey, can I use an AVR? Do I need a tube amp? Can I use a solid state amp? And I had their quote answered in my review, and we'll talk about that. But the short answer is they said, you can use whatever you want. Some people like to use other amps for various reasons. Uh, also, I listened to the speaker in a number of ways. So it was brought out from the walls by about three feet. It was pushed toward the walls at two feet and one foot. I had the data for the measurements using a moving mic method on that in the review, and I'll touch on that when I get to that point. But these are things that I thought worth noting up front because I know that some people are sticklers for, well, and you should be, uh, making sure that you have, you know, not necessarily the right amp, but enough power for the speaker. And in this case, I mean, it doesn't take much. Uh, and also placement, you know, and, and that's something maybe that I don't talk about as much as I should when I talk about reviewing speakers. So I'll try to make sure I note that more in future reviews, starting with this one. And like I said, I uh, put it at about a foot, two feet, three feet. I actually found that three feet was the best. A foot was supposed to help the base, but it really didn't. So, yeah. Uh, but with that said, let me go ahead and pull up the review from my website. And the website will be linked uh, in this description if you want to go find it later on. And I do ask, if you're going to ask questions about the speaker, to hold those until maybe I'm done. And the other thing is, since I want this review to be just about this speaker, I'm going to not 
probably talk about anything else except for the speaker. So if you have questions about other things, maybe ask them later in another review or maybe just ping me somehow. Facebook, leave me a message in the description or leave me a comment below and uh, we'll, we'll deal with that at that time. OK, so right now, Heresy 4 and let's go. Uh, let me blow this up a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. Get rid of some of these things and move some things around. You know, I really like doing live reviews because it's just, honestly, it's easier on me. And I'm much more of an off-the-cuff person. If I have to think about something, then I don't know. I just think about it too much. So it's easier for me to do reviews just off the cuff. It's like we're talking, you know, we're friends. Hey, we're chatting. Let's talk about the speaker, except you can't talk back to me. Yeah, I got to admit, that's kind of nice. Anyway, uh, so here's a cool picture of the speaker. I say it's a cool picture. I took it. I'm biased, whatever. Uh, I don't have the grill in it right now, but as you can see, you know, I've got the Wolfer, you've got a mid-range waveguide, you've got the tweeter waveguide. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly what color this is. I know they have like two or three different colors, and this is one of the colors. I actually do like it. I think I do have a picture of it with the grill on. Yes, right here. And uh, in a way, it's kind of neat looking. Uh, some people love it. Some people don't. I am a bit ag agnostic toward it. You know, I, I neither hate it nor do I love it. I, in a way, I think it's neat. And yeah, on the back, we have the port. And then you have where you can buy Amplify the speaker if you wish, or you can just single amplify it. And you've got some links on it. And I'll blow this up a little bit for you, maybe to help you out see a little bit better. And OK, so here are the notes from the manufacturer's page that I just hijacked. Uh, they talk about some of the specs. I'm not going to waste our time going over specs. 3200 USD for a pair. Um, I'm not going to recommend that you buy these just because it's not something I'm interested in. However, if it is something that you're interested in, you like the data, you like what you see, and you find that it might be worthwhile for you to try, um, I ask, encourage you to check out the speaker through justaudio.com, who is an affiliate link of mine, and they provide me with uh, a commission. If you buy something, that helps me keep this channel going. And if you don't want to buy through them, don't. That's simple. Okay. See? See how easy it is? Affiliate links. People think they're the devil. I mean, it's like, if you want to buy it, you can do it through that, or you can just Google the dang thing. Buy it any way you want. Uh, inside of the speaker, there's a bunch of stone, 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 foam stuffed up inside of the speaker cabinet. Uh, but the interesting thing is that there is no bracing inside. So it's just a bunch of just foam kind of stuffed up in there. Here's a close-up of the crossover, if you're interested in checking this out a little bit later. And then this is kind of my spiel about what the near-field scanner is and how it allows me to measure a speaker anechoically in a non-anechoic environment. And I have an interview with one of the designers of Clipple's near-field scanner. If you want to check that out, you can just click this little play button and watch it. It's about two hours long. It's very long, but it's really packed with a lot of information and some really cool stuff about the history of the near field scanner, you know, as it was initially thought up, uh, prototyping, things like that, and uh, where it came to be now. Water break. All right. Let's see here. Um, the reference plane is at the tweeter, and testing was performed without the grill. Now, I did do a test later with the grill. I'll show you that in a little bit. And if you're wondering why at the tweeter, well, most horn designs, uh, and waveguide and horn are two separate things, although, you know, a horn is a waveguide, or I should say a waveguide is a horn. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, so in this case, I wanted to test it at the tweeter. So I verified with Klipsch that that was indeed the best way to do it. They said you can use it with a built-in stand. Uh, you could set it on top of a stand or whatever, but they are angled. The speaker itself is slightly angled to put the tweeter at ear level. And that's kind of the design axis. And therefore that's what I went with. Now, when I tested the speaker, the stand is kind of hollow. I can't think of an easier way to tell you about that. So what that allowed me to do is I just place the speaker flat on the clipple stand. And um, therefore there is no angle to account for when I did the measurement. So even though the speaker was flat, it's measured like it would be if it were sitting on the floor angled toward your ear. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, so first thing is first, the Spinorama data. And try to blow this screen up a little bit more. That way it comes through here. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, oh, the mic is placed. Yeah, sorry about that. 
That was me testing it earlier. <laughs> Such a non-pro, guys. Check it out. Look. Oh. All right, so you know those reviewers who have like such nice scenery and they have all the bokeh, bokeh? All the stuff in the background just looks so nice. Well, I tried to do that at one point. So I threw some albums up there. I know this is totally off topic, but just bear with me. I threw some albums up there because, you know, if I showed albums, that means I love music, right? Well, I do. Um, and these are some of my favorites. But I thought that would be kind of a neat touch. Aaron's Audio Corner. I got albums in the background. But two weeks later, my daughter takes over. So she grabbed one of my tables in here. And now she's painting in my office. So, yeah, I'm not one of those dudes who has time or has the luxury of having a beautiful living space. And, you know, I'm going to make it look all nice and photogenic and all that stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a regular dad with limited time. So this is what you get. And I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> so with that said, the, uh, the Clips Heresy 4, the on-axis response in the black line, and, and I know this may not show up too great, so just kind of keep an eye on where my mouse is going. Uh, this shows you the non-linearity of the speaker. And really and truly, above about, what, maybe 700 hertz or so, maybe 600 hertz, you know, it's actually reasonably linear. Uh, I'm not saying it's flat. Uh, don't get me wrong there. But it's not the worst thing in the world. I've certainly seen worse. But my issue with this speaker and how it sounds when I listen, because I always listen first, look at the measurements later, really comes into play in this 100 to about three or 400 hertz region. And you see this dip. That's about a three to four dB dip right in the vocal region, like right in the meat of the vocals. Oh, uh, man, you know, uh, I don't like that. But not only that. Wait, there's more. Around 120 hertz, you see this little this little bump right there. Now, if you don't have high resolution data, which thankfully the Clipple Near Field Scanner allows me to do that, you won't see this little bump. You know, it'll be very smooth. And then this one around 160 hertz or so, you won't see that either because again, that'll be very smooth. Now, why do I point that out? Because these are resonances. How do I know they're resonances? Well, yeah, I look at the data and I know, but no, 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 no. When I listen to them, oh my God, the the vocal, just the the boomy, the boxy sound of lower male vocals was terrible, terrible. Enough to the point where that alone would be why I would not buy this speaker. I mean, literally that, because it would drive me insane. Now, having said that, some people could, could hear the speaker and might not notice it at all. Uh, in fact, based on the number of reviewers who have reviewed this speaker and have made no mention of this, and I got to think maybe they just, maybe they've kind of ignored it because they thought it was the room, or maybe they just don't pick up on these things. And I'm not saying I'm golden eared. Uh, easy example. Maybe there are things in the high frequencies that they would pick up on that I might not. So that really is more about experience and my experience with tuning systems and listening to mid-bass clarity, mid-bass phase with subwoofer, that really plays a lot into how I hear mid-bass when I listen to speakers. And for that reason, I'm quite sure that that's why I heard what I heard and this 120 resonance and this 160 resonance. So going beyond that, you know, what else can I talk about? Well, there's there's a strong on-axis dip. Now that on-axis dip, probably not enough to make you go, no, I don't like the speaker. Uh, the fact that it's a dip means it's less noticeable, less offensive. That's probably a better word. Uh, than it would be if it were a strong on-axis peak. And it's a fairly narrow cue. It's not super narrow, but it's fairly narrow that I think that if you noticed it, it probably wouldn't stand out. You just might notice um, a little bit of, well, I guess maybe the inverse of boxy sound because you can get some boxy harmonics at around the seven, six, seven to 800 hertz region. So that may not sound as bad to you or as noticeable. It may take some of the edge off in that regard to some speakers or some some music but you got to remember if it's taken it away from what was originally there then is that something you want and it's just something to keep in mind okay because people talk about certain genres of, of music being played better with certain speakers and I'm, I'm not one of those kind of people that's not how i review speakers uh then going a little bit further there's another strong on-axis dip but you know in the listening window which is an average of plus or minus 10 degrees vertically and plus or minus 30 degrees horizontally 
uh, it kind of smooths out. So that listening window kind of smooths things out. So that's not as troublesome to me. And then overall, you know, these curves tend to follow pretty well, except for this one to two kilohertz region. And that indicates, at least in this data, because I'm, I kind of know what the crossovers are, uh, indicates a crossover directivity mismatch, uh, either in the horizontal window or the vertical window. And we'll go a little bit further and talk about that. And mainly it's in the vertical window, but it does certainly show up in the horizontal window as well. Allow me to get another water break. Crunch some ice. By the way, it's like 920, 920 here. Guys, I'm gassed. Um, I'm used to waking up like 530, heading out to work super early. And nine o'clock is like my bedtime. I know I'm a wuss, but that's how it is. Anyway, so let's talk about the roll off because a couple other reviewers have said, well, maybe not a couple, at least one in particular, Andrew Robinson, said that this speaker to him, and I don't want to misquote, but something to the effect of it, it doesn't need a subwoofer. And I think this data shows you that it does need a subwoofer. Now, the way he had it positioned in his room, maybe there's a strong mode that picks up around the 50, 60, 70 hertz region that maybe levels this out a little bit. But in my room, no matter where I put it, one to three feet out from the wall, it didn't do anything for it. You can still clearly see it falling off pretty quickly. Uh, it rebounded below that, but still the rate of roll off was enough to tell me pretty immediately without even looking at the data yeah, the speaker's rolling off around 100 hertz, and that was pretty noticeable. Uh, the directivity index, you know, I, I just mentioned that, and I'm going to look at the early reflections because that's really what I want to focus on right now. And ideally, what you want is a smooth line, uh, linear slope, or even flat, depending on kind of what directivity you're going for. But what we see here is when you get to one kilohertz, you know, you drop down pretty hard. And most likely what this means is that the mid-range is either beaming or the... Uh, the tweeter in this case is being crossed over too high or a combination of both. So it kind of depends on where the crossover is placed on the speaker. Near field measurements that I provide later will kind of give us an idea of that. But the bottom line, it doesn't matter necessarily what's causing it, is the fact that it is there. And that means that what you hear in your reflections compared to your on axis response is going to vary. And the reason that is important is because the timber that you hear, the timbre, I say timber, I still can't say it right. It bothers me that it's spelled T-I-M-B-R-E. Definitely looks like timber, timbre, Spanish. Joe knows what I'm talking about. So timbre, going back to this now. That means the timbre from the on-axis response versus the sidewall response is going to be different. Will you notice it? Uh, with an A-B test, yeah, absolutely you would notice it. With just the speaker by itself, if you don't have a good reference, Maybe not so much, but it is noticeable. I did do a, some A-B testing with the Forte 4 and also with the KEF LS50 Wireless 2, which is one of my new favorite speakers uh, within limits. Um, yeah, it's certainly noticeable. So that's the CEA 2034 testing, early reflections. Y'all can read this later. Estimated interim response. I'll briefly mention this and then we'll get more into it later. This kind of tells you that in the room, what you can expect to have is a dip through the mid-range uh, some peaking going on around 400 hertz or so. This dip on axis we mentioned earlier shows up on and off axis. And then there's a boost around the 1 to 2 kilohertz region. Now, this is, you know, an average of direct and early reflection sound kind of muddled together in a, in a way that presents itself to you that will match very, very closely to what you actually will get in your room. And I tell you that this is actually really indeed quite close uh, the speaker to me came off as bright, uh, resonant in the lower region. And the reason it came off resonant in the lower region, I've already talked about that. But the reason it came off bright is because ideally you kind of want like a sloping response in room. The fact that it's almost flat out here is going to make itself sound a little bit bright. And this one to two kilohertz bump, very forward sound. And I do not like that at all. So, going to keep going. Uh, this is horizontal, off-axis. You can check this out later. Vertical, you can check this out later. We're going to look at the horizontal plot and then normalize. I'm going to keep going because, to me, this is stuff you can check out on your own time. I don't want to spend too much time on the same thing I'm about to show you here. This is my glow plot. I like this over the contour plots. I'm going to show this every time. Uh, this kind of gives you an idea. It's supposed to represent what the radiation pattern of the speaker is in free space. And this is the horizontal radiation pattern. So it's the bird's eye view looking into the screen, top down. And what this means is that 
And the low frequencies, you're at about maybe, if you follow this line down, plus or minus 40 degrees. And then you get to the mid frequencies, you're about the same. And then at around, what is that, 1.3, so 1 kilohertz to, uh, I don't know, maybe 2 kilohertz or so, you jump out in width. So basically what this means is that the sound stage that you're going to hear in your room that's reflected off the side walls and pointed right at you is going to go wide at some frequencies, narrow at some frequencies, wide at some frequencies, narrow at some frequencies. And the reason that I don't like that is because let's say you've got a, um, a vocalist and they're singing a fundamental around like two, 250 hertz, okay? And let's say that they're very wide in sound, plus or minus 60 degrees. Then at 500 hertz, one octave up, maybe that, maybe that radiation pattern starts to collapse in because uh, the woofer is beaming. And this is hypothetical, but just to give you an idea. Let's say that at 500 hertz, the radiation pattern narrows up because the woofer is beaming and it hasn't properly handed off to a mid-range yet. That means that the harmonic is going to be more narrow in sound. Um, it's an interesting concept, and when you see it pictured like this, I think it gives you a better idea of what the radiation pattern is doing and how that's going to affect your sound stage, uh, the sense of your sound stage, and the focus of the in images within that sound stage. Uh, and then you get to this, what is this, the 2 to 3.2 kilohertz. It's just a strong dip. I mean, you've lost almost 6 dB at some points at your 40 degree angle. So, yeah, some really weird radiation stuff that I just wasn't fond of horizontally. And uh, now let's go look at the vertical globe plot, the vertical polar. No, I'm get some water first here. By the way, if anybody happens to own a Chick-fil-A, hook a brother up because I love some cookies and cream shakes. All right. Low frequencies. Um, I don't know. You're what? Plus or minus 30 to 40 degrees, depending on where you kind of draw the line at here. Uh, maybe as much as 50 degrees downward. Oh, and by the way, this is vertical. So this is like you looking at the side of the speaker with the front going toward zero degrees and the back going toward 180 degrees. Okay. Uh, as you go in the mid frequencies, you can see that there's a very wide, I mean, it's very tall radiation, right? Uh, going up, but going down, there's a big suck out right here. And that's very interesting. Um, going up to the mid high frequencies, there's a suck out going up, but there's a lot more energy being sent down. Okay, and then going again to the maybe the lower treble region, you've got another suck out, strong suck out. Uh, basically means that you're going to have to sit directly on axis because if you go above the speaker even 10 degrees, you're 6 dB down from the mean, uh, and that's a lot. But if you go down 10 degrees, you're still within the mean quite well. And then going up higher in frequency, you get a little bit more brightness, and it's a little bit more even through here. But yeah, the vertical response of this speaker is not very good. I think that they use shallow slopes for their low pass, and we will see that in a second, hopefully. But now let's focus on the on-axis response linearity. So this is just me taking the on-axis response, drawing a mean line to get the average sensitivity. Again, this is anechoic, and I'm showing 94.5 dB average between 300 hertz to 3 kilohertz. Uh, Eclipse spec, I don't even remember what it is anymore. It could be 99, it could be 97. I really don't remember. But to Eclipse's credit, they do put a little asterisk there and they say in room sensitivity. So when you put a speaker in a room, depending on where you put it in the room, you can boost the sensitivity anywhere from 3 to 6 dB. If you put it really close to a wall, you're going to get extra boundary gain. If you put it in the corner, you're going to get even more boundary gain. So that's how that works and that's how they. Uh, you know, get away with providing a higher sensitivity. But again, they are honest that they do provide that as an in-room. And if you add 3 to 6 dB, you'll get what they specify in their uh, manufacturing or their marketing material. So they're not, people say that they lie and, and Clips doesn't lie. It's just, it's an asterisk. You've got to pay attention to that. Um, some companies do worse than that. So I'm not really going to complain too much about that. It's just, you've got to be aware of that. But with that said, you know, you can look and see that the speaker is within plus or minus 3 dB for the most part, but it's just so ragged. I mean, it's just going everywhere. And it's, yeah. So, I don't know. I think they could do better. F3 at 77 hertz. So that means it's fallen 3 dB from the mean at 77 hertz. 
and it's 10 dB down at 49, so 50 hertz. That means you're not going to hear any fundamental kick drum or anything like that. At best, you might get some synth pop stuff around 60 to 70 hertz. Uh, absolutely going to need a subwoofer regardless of what other reviewers say. All right. Uh, so let's look at the impedance, and I'm going to focus on the lowest portion dips down to about 4 ohms. So you could theoretically drive this with an AVR, check that your AVR is capable of doing that. Uh, especially if you use a crossover, an active crossover, and pair it with a subwoofer, then it takes the load off. Pun kind of intended, maybe. Uh, but the other thing to notice is, see where these little ripples are in the impedance? Those are areas of resonance. So that's why I always say that if you just make a simple impedance sweep, you can often see resonances from the drive unit itself, from the enclosure, or from the port. And the enclosure will be like the, the sidewall vibrations as well as the standing waves inside the enclosure. So you can see those things in a very simple impedance sweep. Uh, there's no reason for any audio reviewer to not have a Dayton Dats V3. And all you got to do is go whoop and sweep it, and you can say, yep, there's a resonance. Okay. Group delay. Uh, honestly, guys, when it comes to group delay, I don't know. I, I've reviewed this stuff like a bajillion chimes, a bajillion times. Um, and you hear so many different things. Uh, Lori Fincham, if you are watching, let's maybe make a future discussion about group delay because I know you have sent me stuff on that uh, AES papers and I just haven't read them. Um, but I would really like to talk with you about that. I'm sure the audience would as well. Personally, when I look at group delay, the things that I'm paying attention to are any discontinuities from linearity. Linearity meaning not just a, just a flat line, but just, you know, a smooth response. And, and a curve isn't linear unless it's infinite infinitesimal little linear lines within the curve but i'll let you math nerd nerd out on that i'm just a lowly engineer so my math skills are bunk um the other thing i like to pay attention to is looking at the offset in time because this is essentially time delay um as you hand off from one speaker to the other so let's say that you know if you built a speaker and you've got uh or you know you got an offset of a tweeter versus a woofer that would show up in group delay as a time delay. Or if you properly built an all-pass filter and then you have aligned in time these speakers, then that would show up as a flat line in group delay, ideally. Uh, I don't know if I've seen that yet, but I'll try to pay more attention to that later. Uh, but we can see that the group delay does rise, and there are some things going on here. You see, again, that this dip around 500 hertz, 600 hertz, that's just doing some weird stuff, man. And then you jump up on the low frequency, uh, I don't know what the tuning is. Let's go see where the tuning for the speaker is. Uh, looks like it's where the zero line is for the phase. Where did it go? Yeah, it's going to be right where this guy is. So where this little purple blip comes back up. And that is 30, 40, about, no, 38, 38 hertz or so. And let's see. Yeah. So I don't know necessarily what is causing this. I'm assuming that this was the port velocity uh, minimum at the tuning frequency, but I'm not seeing that, so I'll have to brush up on my skills on that for the next review. Uh, step response, yeah. All right, so a step response is, ideally you have the tweeter come in, then followed by the mid, then followed by the mid woofer, if that's a three-way speaker. If it's a two-way, it's tweeter, and then the mid range woofer. Uh, the polarity decides the direction, the amplitude direction of the step response, and you know, I see some people say that what you want is the tweeter coming in, reverse polarity to the midwoofer, and then it goes straight down, and then it settles out, and then you, you get into that um, critical point where it is damped. Other people will say that you're supposed to have a tweeter spike up, come down, mid, come down, and then you go into your critically damped or your damped uh, behavior. You know, honestly, I don't know what the right answer is. To me, an, an ideal one, and I know the ideal one is more – you come up, you flatline, and then you drop down. That's that's a square wave, I believe. Uh, but you're not seeing that behavior. And the things that I tend to pay attention to, more so than where the tweeter comes in, is what happens with the step response as you're going lower in frequency. Are you seeing any kind of discontinuities? Uh, you're not really seeing any in here, but you've got one right there uh, at around, I don't know, what is that, 8.75 milliseconds? And if you get it at seven, so somebody would have to do the math, but what this accounts to is that you should see some kind of irregularity at around one or two, one and a half, maybe two milliseconds 
ND frequency response. Uh, if you want to do that, it's just one over the time, then times 1,000 to get it to seconds. So I will let you guys do that. Uh, let's see here. Near field response. So this is me just putting the microphone not right up next to the speaker because if you put it right next to the speaker, then it won't be quite as accurate. So I kind of back it out about 15 centimeters from the baffle. I try to do that pretty regularly. And that way I can measure just the component influence on the speaker. Let me see here. Okay, doing all right on time. Sorry, it's long-winded, but, you know, that's what the live ones are for. It's a little bit more deep, more of a deep dive. All right, uh, the tweeter is in the red. And, yeah, I'm not really seeing anything here. Uh, the green is the midwoofer. And if you look, I'm showing a crossover point, and this is all relative, so it's not exact, but it looks like the crossover point is somewhere around the 4.7 kilohertz region. Um, but the thing that bothers me is this strong dip. Now, this could be uh, the placement of the speaker, uh, the, of, the, of the microphone. So if I back this out a little bit further, does it go away? I have to scroll back up and look at the on-axis response again. Or it could just be diffraction from the... Um, the enclosure, the face of the enclosure, the baffle, is about that much inset of the outer portion of the speaker uh, enclosure. So then that gives them enough room to snap the grill into place and the grill sits flush with the speaker. So you could get some of that effect in here. Uh, again, I'm not 100% sure, and I will leave that to you sleuths to go dig into that if you would like to do so. But let's see here. Yeah, it's not a steep slope falling off. Uh, it's relatively shallow, I would say, and I'm going to say this is some kind of acoustical inter interference for argument's sake. Uh, going over here, it's a relatively steep slope falling off uh, for the high-pass filter. But the thing that, that I don't like is here's the midwoofer in this purple, right? Very shallow crossover, and that allows the midwoofer breakup to enter, and I'm thinking that's what I've got around 600 hertz. And if you do the math on a, what is this, a 12? Uh, if you do the math on a 12, it's 13,500 inches per second divided by 12 inches. Uh, then divide that by two. That gets you approximate beaming. And then if you go about an octave above that or so, usually that's when you enter breakup. Um, and that math is probably somewhere in this region. So it stands to reason that this might very well be breakup. Now, this could also be a standing wave inside the enclosure just caught by the measurement of the midwoofer. I do not know for sure. So I'm putting it out there. Uh, the other thing, now we've got the port in black. Uh, strong dip, but the port's got some stuff going on. It's definitely contributing to the coloration of the speaker. And you can see these kind of things showing up in the on-axis response as well. Um, and, and I don't know, again, if this is the port or if it's the enclosure. To me, I'm not, I'm not the one making the speaker. Uh, if somebody wants to go out there and play around and try to fix it up a little bit or improve it, then you can use this data to help you go along with that. I would recommend stuffing the port first and using a Dayton Dats V3 and doing a simple impedance sweep and seeing what that does to the ripples and the impedance response. If it doesn't clear those up, then start adding bracing because uh, more than likely it just needs to be braced well. And I don't know if damping would really help it anymore. Harmonic distortion. There you go. It's in colors. Mm. 86 dB. All right. Um, I mean, it looks okay to me, but I got to say, with the speaker sensitivity and it's relatively low level for this relatively high sensitivity speaker, it kind of concerns me that you're seeing this peak in uh, distortion right here. And I try to remember what the crossover point is. I seem to remember thinking that that's probably the uh, mid range driver or compression driver. I can't remember what they use in this speaker now. Uh, it's probably just being, it's crossed over a little bit too low. So you're getting some distortion coming in there. And on the low end, you've got some higher portion of distortion, but this is a high sensitivity mid woofer. And I don't expect it to have super low distortion below, you know, maybe 80 Hertz or so for its size. That's just based on uh, experience measuring pro audio high sensitivity woofers in the past. Okay. Now going on to 96 dB. And this is really where things just don't, look good for the speaker. Again, it's a high sensitivity speaker. So you wouldn't necessarily want it to have uh, these distortion spikes. And I'm again, I'm willing to kind of maybe forgive the low frequency distortion, but this also feeds back into, you need a subwoofer. That's all I'm gonna say. Okay. Again, you've got this Haas, Haas peaking speaking, high piking, 
peaking, spiking, whatever. Big boom in, uh, in distortion here. So again, I'm thinking that's probably just too low of a crossover point for the speaker. Uh, for the mid-range, it probably needs a higher crossover point. That'd be my guess. Dynamic range. So this is the one that I like to do because it will kind of give you an idea of the instantaneous output limitations of a speaker when it's played at lower volume versus higher volume. Uh, if you haven't watched my video on what these measurements mean, I highly encourage you to do that because I talk about this kind of stuff in more detail. Uh, so for now, we're going to just kind of skip to the point of the data. So I'm testing at 76 dB, and then these lines are all compared to that. What you can see in the red is the output at 86 dB, and ideally all these lines would be flat. That would mean that as I'm adding output, I'm not getting any change in the frequency response. It's staying the same. It's just increasing in SPL. But when it doesn't stay linear and when it does change the frequency response and in turn go higher in output, uh, that's when these lines will go to a non-line, so not flat, which means that at all these output volumes, you can see a few common themes. Higher distortion creates enhancement on the low frequency end around 50 hertz. Um, this right here, I'm thinking, again, is power handling on the mid-range, and it's creating compression of as much as 1.5 dB at 102 dB output. Now, that's loud, and this is at 1 meter, though. So if you go put this in a room for a pair, let's see, a pair is another 6 dB, uh, so that's 108. And then if you're in room, that's about 111 dB, just give or take. Uh, 3db room gain and then let's say you're what four meters away so that's am i doing this right 12 db off of that so 111 so about 99 db so that's pretty darn loud um and and yeah you i don't know that i can really fault this speaker a whole lot but the the point is that you know with this being a high sensitivity speaker and and noted as one that everybody loves to jam out to especially older audio file types who maybe don't have quite the hearing they used to, so they turn it up even louder, you're going to get compression, which means that the frequency response is no longer the same way it was at one output level versus another output level. So if you have an instrument that hits at around 800, 700 hertz or so, well, you're going to lose SPL. You're going to lose as much as about a dB or so at higher volume. So it's worth noting. And then the same thing, you've got more enhancement down here. Um, this could be distortion due to the tweeter. Now, this also could be compression um, due to the parts use, because I don't know if it's a crossover design thing or, or what. So, yeah, it's data. I think it's interesting, and it kind of gives you an idea of the limitations of the speaker. Now, for long-term testing, playing the speaker at 86 dB at 2 meters and then at 4 meters, 4 meters, at 2 minutes and then at 4 minutes, uh, the real takeaway here is that the response doesn't really change that much. It shifts a little bit at 50 hertz, but I'm going to suggest you probably use a subwoofer for this speaker uh, if you want the lower frequency stuff anyway, and it's only half a dB. That's not really that big of a deal. And then at 96 dB, it's pretty much the same story. So long-term listening doesn't really have an effect on the linearity of the speaker. It's really just the output levels that you're listening to. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, CSD, and the only reason I'm putting this in there is so you can kind of see some evidence for the resonances that I was hearing in the 120, 160 region. Uh, the grill effect. So the Heresy 4, like I said, I tested it without the grill, and that is in black. That's the anechoic response. And then I measured it anechoic uh, with the grill on, and that is in red. So you can kind of see that the actual, actually the grill in some way does help smooth the higher frequency response. Uh, the only thing is I don't know what it does when you go off axis and I honestly just forgot to measure it and then I didn't care to go back and set it all up again. Um, so there you go. Take it or leave it. All right, so the in-room prediction versus the measured in-room response. The in-room prediction is in black and the in-room response are, let's see here, with the speaker at one foot from the wall is in blue. With the speaker at three feet from the wall, that's in red. And you may see these, and if you remember me talking about those resonances earlier, you say, well, Aaron, these are the resonances that you heard, surely. Well, surely not. Uh, yeah, certainly one would think that, and, and I would think the same thing, but I've listened to a boatload of speakers in this room. I listened to this speaker in a totally different room the last time I heard it, and I still heard those issues. 
So it's not the room, it's the speaker. Uh, the room is creating these modal issues. Uh, so it's there in every speaker I test. And this is one of the very, like probably two or three speakers that I've heard that have uh, a lower male resonance. And again, it shows up in the impedance and it shows up in the actual data. So it's not the room, it is the speaker. Uh, the room just doesn't help it. Uh, going up in response, you can see that the, um, let's see here, the black gets off uh, the actual inner room response a little bit around the one to, what is that, 1.3 kilohertz region or so. Uh, that may be responsible for the forwardness that I heard. Uh, it's more prevalent in this than it is in the prediction. And then if you're wondering, you know, why, why the prediction is off in the low frequencies, again, that's in room stuff. So the room is always going to color it. So usually below about 500 hertz is where I kind of draw the line and say, all right, most of this is the room. Uh, anything else you hear, you've got to verify with the measurements. And we can also see the response is falling off on the low frequency end below 100 hertz, simply as we expected. Uh, you do have a room mode there around 60 something hertz. That helps out, but it's certainly not enough. And uh, let's see here. Anything that I wanted to note? Um, I think honestly that I covered it. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's really it. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to drag this back over. And I haven't looked at anybody's comments yet. So give me a minute to go through these comments. Uh, and like I said, I'm really focused on uh, just the questions about this speaker. So if you have any others, I'm not going to talk about those right now. So uh, Homeboy asks integrated amp. Yes, I'm sorry. That, that's what it was. Parasound Hint 6. Um, very nice, nice integrated amp. I do have their new Classics 200. Now, both of these... They have loaned me, and I, I keep, I, one of these days I'm going to measure them. And the reason I say one of these days is because I got this Quant Aslam. Let me let this zoom off of my face. Where it is. There it is. All right. Uh, I don't know, maybe a month ago. Um, and I'm going to start doing electronics measurements, but it's not going to be to the degree that Soundstage does them or Stereophile. Um Gold Sound, uh, Amir, you know, some of the other usual suspects. Uh, I just don't have the tools, and I really don't have the desire. So, yeah, but that's a different conversation later. Sorry. Let's see here. Um, hey, I, I, I'm noticing some of y'all's comments and saying positive things, and I appreciate them. I'm not going to be an egocentric dude and throw them all up there and get big-headed, so I'm just going to say I appreciate them. Um. Okay, let's see here. Uh, so, so that's not the measurements I expected from the kind of speaker. Interesting. No, so I got to be honest, I didn't know what to expect. Um, the reason that I was loaned the speaker specifically was because the guy who owns them watched the review. Again, Andrew Robinson, I'm not picking on him, but these, these are facts, so I'm just laying them out there. Uh, Andrew Robinson had said great things about the speaker. The guy bought them. The guy didn't like them. He was wanting to know why he didn't like them. So he brought on me and asked me if I would listen to him, and I would test them. And I said, sure, and here we are. And I will say that the Forte 4, which really sounds like I'm trying to do the Joe Dirt style of uh, Dierte and, and say 44 and, instead of Forte, like Dierte, Hopefully y'all get the reference there. Um, that speaker, even though it's not perfect, it's not without its issues. I like that speaker uh, much more than, well, I can't say much more than I do the Heresy 4. I do not like the Heresy 4 at all. If somebody said, I will give you this speaker, but you have to keep it and listen to it, I would say, no, thank you. And that is the honest truth. That is my opinion. Everybody can have them. You're entitled to your own if you have one. All right. Um... 100 hertz, man, you need a subwoofer that can play above that then? Yeah, no, I mean, there, there's certainly truth to that. Uh, just watch Toy's new video on home cinema speaker. What a superb, smooth graph. And then I'll look at this graph, yeah. So, Toy, um, I did actually watch a few minutes of his video, but then I had to stop because I I don't live a life where I can take time to just sit down and watch videos all day. Unfortunately, I do miss those days sometimes. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was interesting where he was going. I never got to see the finished product. Um, all right. I'm sensitive to sibilance. I have C's, magnesium, 
drivers with a huge breakup above, yeah, even a notch filter there when I hear it. Yeah, I mean, sibilance is, is always a problem with uh, with any speaker when it when it is there. So I'm meaning that if it's in the speaker, then it's, it's something that I noticed right away. So I'm, I'm with you there. Crazy how poorly this speaker performs for the money. There are probably speakers that sell, you know, so I agree. I, I don't know maybe about the 200. Uh, I'm not going to necessarily put a price to it. But, yeah, I was really disappointed at some of the issues that the speaker has. I feel like Clips owners, uh, you know, again, the heresy people love heresy speakers. But I got to think that Clips could have offered a better product at the price and certainly one without the resonances that it has. If it weren't for that, you know, maybe I wouldn't have as many complaints. But to me, though, that's just a deal breaker. And I really, it bothers me that that it's there, you know. Um, I'll leave it at that. But again, the Forte 4 doesn't have those problems. It's, it's actually a good speaker. I was really surprised because I went into it like, oh, great, another clip speaker. And I know I shouldn't be biased, but guys, it happens. You know, you all have your biases too. We all do. I uh, uh, don't want to show that one, but I do appreciate it. Okay. Um, yeah, again, I just want to say I, I appreciate you guys with the with the cool things you're saying. I appreciate that. Uh. So, Tony, I I think I agree with you. Uh, I know that Clips can make a better speaker. They are very much targeting a select group of people. But I think they would do better. And, and if they're watching, I mean, I hope that they take this as constructive criticism that – they could fix a few things with this speaker and really make it a much better speaker. Now, it may not be something that I would still enjoy for accuracy, but it wouldn't be something that I would say mm -mm, hard pass to, you know. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I agree with you, though. CEO's had these in two, had a Raven review of them in a small room. So I saw that. I, I went back and watched. So normally what I do is I don't watch anybody's reviews or I don't read anybody's reviews or I try to avoid them uh, until I do mine. And I do that because I don't want to be influenced by what they said. That's pretty simple, pretty, pretty obvious, right? But I go back and watch them or, or I read people's comments and stuff to kind of get an idea of things I should address in my review. You know, maybe there's something that they left out there that, that I wanted to know more about or people ask questions about them uh, in their reviews that uh, I feel like maybe I could address in mine. So, yeah, I saw that. I saw a lot of people review the speaker and a lot of people liked it. And I'm thinking... Dude, what's wrong? But both speakers measure the same way. So it's not like a bad speaker or anything. Uh, and the owner who brought them to me was disgusted with them. <laughs> so, I mean, there you go. Older still heresies take bass boost gracefully. This ported one, probably not. Uh, I don't know about the older ones, but I mean, that stands to reason. Uh, I think that you could be correct. That's the Joe Dirt reference. Home is where you make it. Yes. Fantasy speakers just like the sound of them rather than how accurate they are, I guess. And that's fine, man. I mean, if you like them, you like them. And, and again, I'm not here to tell you you can't like them. You know, you might like a speaker that I, I love. So you telling me you hate it isn't going to make me not like the speaker. It may maybe be curious why you don't like it. And that's kind of what the purpose of these reviews are, is to explain about uh, what it is I don't like or I do like. Uh, Zeos also by amp them and adjusted the mid tweeter down. So, you know, the, so that begs the question, should clips tell people to do that? And I don't know. Uh, it's just, it, it, it begs the question. That's where the marketers should really do more, I think. So I'm probably going to throat punch you, Kanga, just, just for saying that. All right. So I think that's, uh, through, through most everybody's comments, Joe, it only sounds good with tube amps. Yeah. So that, that goes back to something I mentioned earlier. Uh, some people were like, oh, you didn't listen to this with a tube amp. And I reached out to Klipsch and they said, dude, listen to it with whatever. I talked to the dealer for them or a dealer for them. And they said, yeah, the Paris sound is a perfect amp to use for it. So that's what I did. But I did use an AVR last year and I used an Adcom last year as well. So the only thing I haven't used is a tube amp. And let me tell you, if the tube amp is going to fix the issues that I heard, which it can't, so a tube amp would have to take resonance out of a speaker, can't do that. 
And it would also have to give some boost in the 100 to 400 hertz region to fill in that trough. If you have a speak or an amplifier that's doing those kind of things, it's not a good amplifier. I mean, it's just how it is, guys. You don't want to you don't want an amplifier that intentionally colors the sound. And I've never seen one that colors it in the mid range. Can you imagine the trouble that you have to go through to find the perfect speaker and the perfect amp? And I'm not talking about stuff where people are like. You know, maybe it drives the speaker better, or maybe it has an ethereal sound to it. I mean, that's okay. That's one thing. But when you're talking about measurable things, such as adding 5 dB to 200 hertz with a Q of 1, that's like parametric EQ stuff. If you have an amplifier that does that, if you design an amplifier that does that, you are, I don't know, man. You, you're either doing it completely wrong, or you're a genius, and you're selling these things as matching pairs, with the speakers that are supposed to go with them. I mean, really, just think about it. I'm. You can disagree if you want. You're you're wrong. Um, anyway, so I'm gonna step off my high horse now. It just frustrates me when people when people get to stuff like that. Yeah, no, you cannot DSP out a resonance. You just can't. It's a mechanical thing. You can't take away from it. Now, you may be able to knock it down a level a little bit to where it's not as noticeable, but you're not going to get rid of the mechanical resonance via DSP. You just can't. All right. So let's see here. Um, that's it. I'm not going to keep going any longer. I appreciate everybody, you know, here watching. Uh, if you're watching this later in the playback, I appreciate you taking your time to, to go through this and I uh, hope you learned something. You know, these, these live ones are easier on me. I know they take longer, but we do a deep dive more into these and it's just more fluid. So with that said, I'm going to peace out, and uh, you guys have a great weekend, and I will talk to y'all later as soon as I find the end stream button. Okay. All right. That's it. Take care.